This is the interview show. The U.S. interview show. Man. They're here. <laughs> I'm going to pull the face. Welcome to the Unowebs interview show. Well, thanks for having me. And I can't put the helmet on because I got the headset. <laughs> Mine's bigger than yours. Yours is hey, point. Take it easy, pal. There's people. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the size of the knife. It's how deep you stick it or something. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, those, yeah. I think we should probably uh, yeah, stop, stop right there. <laughs> yeah, we're good. <laughs> I'm gonna put my, I'm gonna put my helmet away as well. <laughs> okay, perfect. Matthew Harfey, thank you so much for joining me on the Uniwebs interview show. My name is Matthew Whiteside. Great first name, by the way. Yeah, it's a good one. Thanks for playing along. How you doing, man? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, my pleasure. So, what's going on? Where are you? Uh, where are you located? So I'm in um, Wiltshire in England, in the United Kingdom, um, which is part of um, – Wiltshire is part of what would have been uh, – in the books I'm writing, it would have been Wessex. So it's West. The, the West Saxons is where okay. I come from. So that name was changed throughout history from Wessex? That's right. Yeah, so Wiltshire is a shire within, within what would have been Wessex, but Wessex doesn't really exist anymore as an entity, but – in the books, so a right. shire is like what I imagine in The Hobbit, and that is it like very hilly and green. Well, yeah, I mean, yes, yes, it is actually sort of not huge hills, but yes, yeah, so rolling green hills and and trees and woodland and stuff. Yes, yeah, nice. I can I can show you out the window. Look, you can see a view out of my window. Look, here we go. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't know if it's going to pick up on that. Wait a minute, see if I can carry you over here. I don't know if it's going to. We're on the move. Oh can you wow! See, can you, can you see that in the distance, some sort of green and yes, I see grass. You have grass in England. We have, we have grass. It's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's sort of you know, it's very green. I used to. I lived in Spain for a while, and um, or for a long time actually. I lived in Spain, and it was um, arid in the in the summer and very brown. And um, when I came back to the UK, I'd always be amazed about how green everything was. It's incredible, right? It's nice, though, when you have so much green around you. It's like life. Yeah, except it just means it's raining all the time. That's the only downside. So you're north. You're north uh, England? No, southern. So it's um, southwest of England. Okay. Did you get snow? We recently? did. Um, we did last week. Yeah, we had um, last Friday. The kids couldn't go to school because it was snowing. So, yeah, it was like a, yeah, a lot of snow, like a foot of snow or something, which for oh, here is a lot I of talk, snow. It's not. I talked to another guy, um, John Bolton. Out, he lives in the same area, I suppose. Uh, a writer, another writer. He he was like, yeah, you got snowed in, basically. Out yeah. there. Is that is that normal weather? No. For no. Last year we had a couple of days like that as well. So it's maybe because of climate change or whatever things. You know, we used to get the climate's snow. not changing, bro. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <not>. right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's not go there. Let's not go there. Yeah. But anyway, it, yeah, we, we're seeing strange weather patterns. So. Okay. I know it hasn't snowed here yet. We were really hoping for it. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, but okay. Um, so Matthew Harvey is the author of is it seven historical fiction books? Uh, yes, there's a novella and, and six novels so far. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. So how long you've been writing? How long you've been writing this series? So the first one, which um, because I'm prepared a little bit, I've got here. I can actually show you. Look, the first one is yes. the Serpent Sword. Ooh. And um, The Serpent Sword, I started writing that back in 2001, um, and then I wrote it for a couple of years, on and off, part-time, you know, I was working full-time, had kids and stuff, and yeah. um, so life was very busy, I didn't get a huge amount done for those uh, in those first couple of years, and then I kind of put it aside, gave up on it, um, until years later, um, so I really picked it up and started writing seriously again back in, I think it was 2012 when E.L. James brought out the Fifty Shades of Grey thing. And she oh, yeah. did so well with these self-published books. They were self-published originally. She was selling like millions and millions of copies. And I thought, man, this is, you know, her, her books are 
probably not my cup of tea. They're probably not really great from what I heard. I don't know because yeah. I've not read them. But you know, I thought they're probably not amazing literature. But um, but she's selling an amazing number of books, and and I thought you know I should I should get on and finish this this thing. And and if I can't self if I can't get a traditional publishing deal, I'll self publish. And so I then knuckled down and I wrote that that year. Eventually, after a lot of toing and froing, I've, I've self published in twenty fifteen. I guess okay. it was. Um, and then since then, I've written like a book every eight, nine months, year, something like that. Oh. So, you've been you've been hammering the keys pretty hard. I've been churning them out <laughs> ever since. Yeah. So how so how did you do uh, indie publish wise? I mean, how did how did the book land? So did it did okay. It? So I, I the reason it didn't I didn't um, self publish until 2015, even though I sort of finished the book, I guess in 2014, um, maybe 2013. I can't remember exactly now the, the dates, but um, the reason there was like a year gap there is because I, I finished it and um, I thought you need to find an agent to be traditionally published. So I sort of looked into you know what you need to do and everyone said you need to get an agent. So I queried agents and I got an agent and then he said, you know, I'm going to take the manuscript around and try and sell it with a London book fair and, and all this stuff. And I don't know, like eight, nine months went by and just rejection letter after rejection letter came through the agent you know every time the, the agent saying you know my agent saying um, you know don't worry you know they don't know what they're talking about it's you know it's, it's a great <laughs> book you know? so he was you know, he's sort of sticking sticking with me and saying you know it's great it's yeah. great but this is normal you always get rejected you only need one to say yes um right. so you know you can you can get rejected many times and i think most authors know what rejection is like but after after about a year of this i'd finished the second book and I yeah. thought, you know, so I gave him the second book and he sort of tried to quit, go around again. And of course, everybody rejected, rejected the first one. They rejected the second one too. It's part of a series. So I said, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to self-publish it. So I did. But yeah. obviously the agent kept on working in the background. So for about a year, I was self-published. The first one was self-published and the second one I published after a few months. Um, um, and in the background, he was still trying to sell it. And a new publisher um, started up an imprint of an independent publisher in the UK. Um, wow. The, the publisher is called Head of Zeus and the imprint was um, Aria. Yeah. And they were trying a new model, which is like digital first. So they publish digital um, ebooks first, print on right. demand books, and then later if you do well, they then do traditional print runs and hard co hard copy and you know hard hardbacks and paperbacks. Right. Um, and he basically he contacted them and said, you know, you're looking for authors for your new imprint and I managed to sign a deal with them and they've published now the the six novels and the one novella that I've written so far. Wow. And I've been with them. Um, and just yesterday, I was actually at there. They, they did a party for all the um, the, the writers in, in London. So I was over in London yesterday and meeting all the, the, the other authors or lots of the other authors. And it was, yeah. it was a cool moment because it's been running about two years, I think, this this imprint. And um, there was about 30 writers in the room. And the CEO said, I'd just like to tell you that out of the 30 people in this room, you know, you've sold more than 1.3 million ebooks between Holy you guys in the room. Crap, and we were really? like, what? <laughs> so that was pretty cool. So someone selling more than me is all I'm <laughs> it's all I'm saying. Well, that's amazing though, but, man. Uh, like I can only like... I'm sorry. It would have been nice if it was all me that so if it was all yeah, my right. books. That... <laughs> if it was just straight you'd be fantastic. Well that that's incredible because I mean obviously you you handled that rejection well. You were just, you know, you kind of pushed forward through it. Um and and I think a lot of it gets lost sometimes as as writers and authors. Is I know for myself, I'm very impatient. I want people to know how great I am immediately. <laughs> I'll tell you what, it is it is really it's really difficult. And um, before um, writing, I, I I was into acting, and I've done um, and I sang in a band and stuff. And that that's very immediate. You know, when you're wow. in a band, you sing a song, and then people clap, and you go, "Woohoo! Everyone thinks I'm great." You know, and so yeah. it, it it's cool, but. Writing is the opposite. You know, you spend a year writing the book and doing oh. the editing and everything, and then you send it out to people, and then they spend three or four months sitting on it, and then you say, you know, could you tell me what you think? And then they come back and say, eh, you know what, we don't like it. And then you go, oh, okay, right. And so you, you go through this process, and it's it's painful. But yeah. the, the plus side is that when they do say yes, you know, you <laughs> they publish the book, and, and then, you know, then people see it, and then you start, you know, finding out that people do like it. But I think the, you said about dealing with rejection and I just say yeah. I think that um, the thing to, to do is just if, if you you write something that you want to read and you read it and you think this is what I want to tell this is the this is the story I want to tell I'm happy with this this is yeah. the voice I want to have 
you just got to stick with that and just go with it. Don't try and you know do anything else. Just do what you want to do, and eventually, hopefully, somebody will agree with you. Yeah, that's so profound too, right? Because as writers, um, we, we're looking for our voice because I feel like there's enough people in the world. You know, over seven billion people in the world. There's enough people in the world that we're going to connect our voice with other people. You know, I think. And in losing, and I, I know for a long portion of my life, I, I was looking for whatever voice fit whatever people liked, you know, but writing has taught me to really hone in on my voice and what I'm trying to say. And that's one of my other things I talked to you about my goals, but it's one of my goals is just be as steadfast with my voice and rediscover it over and over and over again that because it's there and it, it we all and the whole reason we're doing this too, and I say it in a lot of my videos is that every i think every person has a bestseller best-selling story best-selling book inside of them you know we all have those stories inside of us that are just like they have to come out because they can inspire teach show other people um the way and that's yeah having your voice and sticking with it sticking with it is the hard part it's yeah i yeah, think i think a lot of people make the mistake of thinking you know, you were mentioning before before we came online. You mentioned J.K. Rowling, right? And you, 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 people that are really, really um, popular, you know, incredibly <laughs> successful. And I think people make a mistake sometimes, thinking, okay, yeah, what, what's you know, vampires at the moment is doing really well, or oh, some crime thriller that's you know, certain certain thing on TV, or Game of Thrones, or whatever. And they think, oh, I'm going to try and copy that and try and get in that niche. But yeah. if it's not coming from, you know, G.R.R. Martin, I'm sure he didn't sit down and think, I'm going to try to write this copying someone else. He just said, I'm just right. going to write a great fantasy book. And he just happened to write a great fantasy book that then eventually got picked up and, you know, made into a great TV series. And, and you just got to stick with it. And, and it's a yeah. long game, right? Because the G.R.R. Martin thing, again, you look at that and you think he wrote the first um, Game of Thrones book, um, I think in 95 or something. And it's a long time between... You know, finishing the book and then getting sort of worldwide fame out of it right um, yeah and that's i think we learn that through writing too right it's it's that daily moment by moment process of just putting words on paper and if we just do that enough days in a row and just continue to do that eventually we'll have a book we'll have multiple books we'll have published books you know we'll have maybe best-selling books hopefully that kind of thing but it's that whole like let me just get a couple words out let me get a chapter in. Let me do something today towards writing that book, which is a, it's a testament to it's like a, a um, pathway for life too, right? I mean, I've I've learned that through my writing is that if I just do the thing that I need to do today, it, as little as possible, as little as I can, or as much as I can today, regardless of how I feel, then I'm still moving forward, right? Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. setting yourself goals. Um, you, you know, we were talking before before we came on 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 air or you know on you know online. Um, <laughs> we we were talking about about goals and stuff, and I, I I definitely feel that you should set yourself. It's very useful to set yourself small goals that you can actually yeah. achieve on a weekly basis or a daily basis. You know, so I start each day thinking or each week. You know, I'm going to write X number of words this week, or I'm going to you know I'm going to do this today. And if you can you can tick off a couple of your of your targets each day or each week. You feel you're making, like you said, you're making progress and you actually can look back over the last six months and say, you know what, I started without without a book and now I finished a book because I was writing a thousand words a day or whatever your your goal was. Right. right. What, uh, if you don't mind me asking, so what kind of goals do you set for yourself or what, what type of goals did you set for yourself in the beginning Yeah. and, and like did you see come to fruition? Yeah. So at the beginning, um, when I really took it seriously, I looked and I, I, I read stuff and I because I, I hadn't taken it really seriously to start with and because it was historical fiction. I didn't know anything about the period as so I spent a lot of time reading um, you know, about 7th century um, Britain, which I didn't know anything about. So it took a long time to sort of accumulate the ideas and the storyline. But once I, I sat down, and I said, right, I'm, I'm going to finish this novel. I set myself the goal of 3000 words a week, which mm -hmm. I thought was achievable. I, I read um, Stephen King's on writing. And he says, he says 3,000 words a day, right? So I thought, if he's doing 3,000 words a day and I'm working full time, I can do 3,000 words a week, right? So, right. And, I, and, I, and I did that and, and I, was stick, I stuck to that. Sometimes I'd write 3,500, sometimes I'd write you know, 2,900 or something, but I'd, I'd be close or hit it every, every week. And, and within six months, I'd finished the book. Um, and then after a couple of years, I went down to working four days a week in my day job. 
And I set myself then the target of um, 5,000 words a week. So I thought I've got a whole day that I can spend writing. So I'm going to try and get a couple of thousand words done that, you know, that day. And, and that was fine. I met, I, I hit those targets. Then I yeah. went down to three days a week in my day job. And I still right. stuck with the 5,000 words a week, but I'd, I'd surpass it. Um, and just last, the end of last year, I, I ditched the day job. And so I'm now a full-time writer. And I yes. said, I said, I, yes. But I said, I can't, I can't stick with the, with the 5,000 words a week because that felt like I was just being very lazy. So I said, right. <laughs> I'm going to try to do 2,000 words a day, Monday to Friday. So 10,000 words a week. Um, and so far, I'm just about sticking to it. Although it's not always easy because there's lots of distractions that when you're working full time as a writer, you find uh, you suddenly find that it's much more e it's much easier to be distracted than when you were part time. Because when I was part time, you I would claw out the one hour or two hours that I could write, and I would sort of you know put my headphones on, and say I've got to do this now, leave me alone, and shut myself away, <laughs> knowing that two yeah. hours later I'd come out. Now you kind of sit down and some I don't know something happens and you you maybe got to take the kids to the doctor or you got to clean the house or somebody comes to the front door or I don't know the the the, the day seems to go by quickly and suddenly yeah. you've... well it's like it's it's like trying to now uh, since you don't have since you've been able to dish the day job which is fantastic congratulations on that man you become a full time writer that's like <laughs> dream right but it's it's still it, it's like you turn your full time what you used to have as a full time job. Now writing has become your full-time gig, right? And so yeah. you said something that was very important that I think a lot of people forget about. It's not like I want to become this full-time writer so I can sit around all day in my in my flip my slippers and do nothing. It's like no, I have to I have to like have I have to work like I have to. Yeah. <laughs> However <laughs> nice that would be to sit around doing nothing, right? But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what a <Yes>. life. <laughs> yeah. I think that's no, what people yeah, think. So I think that's what people think the writers do. <clears throat> But um, well, yeah. and there's a bit of it. There is there is some thinking time. You got to you got to you know percolate the the, the ideas. <laughs> yeah. But. Well, yeah. I always joke with my friends that like I tell them I've been writing all day, and it's like they basically think I've just been sitting at home coloring or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I think it's like it's you know. Like your hobby. Yeah, it's like a yeah. I've had like my family still thinks it's a hobby. I'm like, oh, it's not. It's not a hobby. <laughs> I swear. But uh, yeah, it's 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 very important that we carve out that time. Um, because if we're going to make anything of ourselves, like we, you got to that, you got to that, this level now because you put in the work and, um, it's just literally is just putting in the hours. I think the most, that's the other thing I would say to any, anyone who's thinking about writing or has just started writing, or even if they've you know already written a novel or, or, or two, I, I think the most important thing is, or one of the most important things is to finish the books. Right. And that sounds stupid. But it's it's actually there's a lot of people. And I did it myself before. You know, I'd start yeah. writing, and I'd write a chapter of a book, and it would be like an amazing chapter. But I had no idea about what the book was going to be. I'd just write this great <laughs> chapter, and it was based on something yeah. I'd seen in a movie, or you know, some something that had been sort of uh, sparked in my imagination. And maybe I'd been playing Dungeons and Dragons or something, and I had some idea yeah. for something as a teenager or in my twenties, and I'd, I'd write something down. But I had no idea of a hundred thousand word story arc i just had you know two thousand words maybe and the yeah. number of people that say oh, i've got a novel i could write a book and whatever and they write you know 500 words or two thousand words and then they get stuck mm -hmm. you've got to just keep writing it doesn't have to be every day but you've got to write regularly and you've got to keep on just banging out those words because they add up to and then you've got to complete it when you finished it you can sell a finished book you can't sell a, a half finished <laughs> book so here's 35 words <laughs> Our point. Yeah, it's, it it's a, a great book. idea yeah. <laughs> it's a great idea. Well, that's the thing about inspiration, right? It's like uh, following. It's, it's like I get these ideas in my head, and I'm like, "Well, I have no idea what that means." Like I had this idea about birds flying upwards a while back, and I wrote. I was just like, this weird, strange idea came to me, and I was just like, "Okay, I'm just gonna write it down and see what see what it comes from it." So I just wrote down like a paragraph. And then the thought left me completely. But it wasn't until the next day that the inspiration took hold. And it was like, wait a second. And I wrote a whole like 2,000 word blog post about getting into flow, um, about finding inspiration, right? And it's, it's, not a, it's not necessarily like inspiration is like the idea of an idea. And it's like our job to just go after it and take it to the nth degree, see how far we can take that idea because there's a story in that inspiration, right? And that's like our job as writers. 
And that's I think that's why we love it so much, right? Because we can find those morsels of information that people are just like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> where, where did this come from? You know, I think that's the yeah, fun of it. It's the magic of writing. Funnily enough, yeah, inspiration never seems to really strike unless you're sitting down in front of the computer. I mean, you, you, you can have inspiration. You can have inspiration. You're know, walking the dog or doing something yeah. else, but you've actually got to sit down and, and, and write the words, right? But um, we, yeah, it's in the doing of the thing, right? It's not. It's, yeah, it's always in the doing of the thing. I like to say um, I know about kung fu, but I don't know how to do kung fu. Like, yes. The only difference is the practice, right? If I practice, like I would know. Yeah. How to do it. You spent hundreds yes, of hours like, doing it, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's really cool. I, um, so let's talk about your uh, books. I want you to sum up all seven books in 35 words. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. no. So I'll sum up um, a little bit. No, I'll show you another one while I'm at yeah, it. Yeah, please. Uh, the, the covers are fantastic, by the way. Uh, thanks. So um, the this is the, the second book, which is The Cross and the Curse. And the guy that appears on the front, it was his helmet and um, sword that appears on the on the first one. Um, so he's a reenactor, a guy called Matt Bunker. Um, he's like a you know living historian, I, I guess you might call him as well, because he, he works in um, in in the field of, of living history. So they do they go they go out places and talk to people about you know the period and dress up in all the gear. Um, so the series um, is the Benicia Chronicles. And um, it's set in the seventh century in Britain, and that's before the Vikings. And it's at a time when the Romans have left Britain, okay. and on the um, in the the east, sorry, the west coast of Britain um, is the, where the native um, Britons are, are living, who you know, okay. the Welsh. And in fact, the term um, Welsh is an Anglo-Saxon term, which means foreigner. So the, the Anglo-Saxons just called everybody that wasn't you know, from their tribe, they were foreigners. So everybody in the west of, of Britain became the Welsh, which the Welsh, is now okay. Wales and the Welsh, because they're just foreigners to the Anglo-Saxon, to the English. Because, of course, the word English comes from Angle, from the Anglo-Saxons. So basically, they're invading um, slowly but surely from the east. So it's very similar, I think, to the conquering of the United States where you have the, 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 the British coming in and the, the uh -huh. Europeans from the East Coast and the Native Americans getting pushed through to the to the West. Um, yeah. So you've got this frontier land where the fighting uh, takes place and this the, the, these Western invaders, if you, if you will, fighting against the Native Romans left now leave us alone you know so there's this there's, there's fighting going on there's also fighting between the different factions of um of Anglo-Saxons so there's many kingdoms so Britain's quite a small island you know in comparison to to the states obviously it's tiny um but they managed to break it up into small um kingdoms and there's seven Anglo-Saxon kingdoms and then other um wow. kingdoms of the Picts and of the Welsh the Welsh had sort of multiple um kingdoms as well um and they're all fighting each other. You know, everyone's fighting for supremacy. So it's a great time to write about because there's not a huge amount of history. So you can kind of make a lot of stuff up in the gaps. Okay. Um, so you can read the, there's the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and uh, the Venerable Bede, and they talk about major battles and things that happen. But the rest of it, we don't know a huge amount of what was going on, you know, every year. So you can make a lot of stories up around. Just like they were fighting like crazy. They're fighting like crazy, and there's religion is is in upheaval as well because Christianity is coming back into into Britain. The Romans yeah. had brought Christianity originally, but it had kind of sort of gone away from certain areas. The the Anglo Saxons didn't worship um, Christ, so they weren't Christians. But there were missionaries coming in from Rome to the Anglo Saxon kingdoms, trying to uh, to preach to them and to convert them. And there was also Christian monks coming across from the West, from Ireland. So you've got this whole sort of mishmash of old religions and new religions and different peoples all fighting in a <laughs> and, and everything, you know, vying for supremacy, vying for people's hearts and minds. And, and so a really ripe period to, to write about. And not many people have written about that period. Hold on, sorry. I don't know what happened. Oh, there you go. Sorry. Hello. Okay. Okay, back. My bad. Here. So, so yeah. So, not many people have written about that period. Most people that write about the so-called Dark Ages tend to write um, about the Vikings. So, a bit later. So, you've got King Alfred, and we have a. It's like a after the English have settled 
Britain, so after the Anglo-Saxons have settled down for a couple of hundred years, then yeah. there's another wave of invasions, which is then from the Vikings. So that's Danes and um, and Norwegians and Swedish and people. Um, and and that's written about a lot more um, in fiction and in TV, you know, series like the Vikings yeah. series on Amazon. It's much more popular. And the Last Kingdom, Bernard Cornwell as well. Um, so, so yeah, so that's a, a more popular period to write about, but there's just as much violence and action and fun and excitement well, that's, in the that's what I was gonna ask. So what is it about, uh, what was it about this time period that made you decide, hey, I'm going to write a series about it? Or it got you so interested. I mean, what inspired you to do this? Well, that's a good question. And um, what happened was I, for three years as a kid, I'd lived in Northumberland, which is, um, I think I might be able to show you one of the maps in here and you, you can maybe get an idea. I don't know if it'll come out very well. I don't know if people will be able to see. But um, this is a map on the front. Oh, let's see if I can get it there. Um, the north of, of Britain, sort of below below Scotland, basically. Um, so if the map carried on, it would carry on up into Scotland. So this yeah. area, this area here is is now Northum Northumberland. But at the time, and so I lived, so I lived up here as a kid um, for a few years, and. I really, I always remembered the, the place, you know, it's a really, it's very um, uh, cliffy um, uh, coastline and there's old ruined castles and there's, it, it's got a real feel of wilderness about it. There's like natural national parks that are sort of open yeah. expanses of, of hills and, and forests and things. And it always sort of stuck in my mind. And in 2001, I, my wife was working late and I, when I was watching TV and I, and I saw this documentary about a castle called Bambra um, Castle, which is on the coast. Um, uh -huh. And I'd been there as a, as a kid and they were digging out in this documentary, they, they were digging out um, skeletons from the, this, uh, a graveyard that had been unearthed by the sea, eroding the sand because it's right oh, wow. on, right on the seafront, you know, it's right. There's dunes yeah. there. Basically these dunes had been eroded and they, they, they were digging out all of these skeletons and they were from the seventh century <laughs> and it was a seventh century graveyard. And in this program, it talked about how the Bambra, this castle and this rock on the edge of the, of the edge of the sea, um, was the seat of power of the Kings of a kingdom called Bonicia which okay. I didn't even know existed. I'd never heard of before. But Benicia was the northern part of the, well, the northeast of, of England, really, up into the south of Scotland, by modern standards. Uh -huh. um, and it was, so the northern part of, of Northumberland, that it was an incredibly important kingdom at the time. And for the next couple of hundred years, it was the center of where, you know, monasteries were and um, so lots of learning and they wrote lots of, you know, lots of the books that we've got, gospels, the Lindisfarne gospels wow. and um, uh, stuff comes from there. And um, so I just, I just was interested. So I knew the place and I always loved the area. And then I suddenly found out there was this interesting history that I knew nothing about. And I thought most people don't know anything about this. So right. I'm going to going to start writing and literally i finished watching this um, this program on tv and i thought i'm going to start i'm going to write this this i'm going to write a book and i went upstairs i'd never written really anything apart from a few you know a few thousand words before and i sat down and i just wrote the opening chapter the opening scene of uh -huh. the serpent sword which is the first book um and of this guy arriving by by ship on the beach below the craggy rock rocky fortress of of bambra castle and going up the steps to the castle and and that was it and i started like that wow. and then i didn't finish it for 15 years but i <laughs> 14 <laughs> years or something but but yeah that was um, that was how it started that's so cool man it sounds like that that's that time period's like an untapped gold mine of because uh, it sounds like a very influential time like you said a lot of learning was going on a lot of religious stuff a lot of yeah yeah um it took you 15 years to get get back to the to get back yeah. to the book, which is you know, yeah, not fine. quite. Probably, probably took about yeah, probably about yeah, about 10, 12 years something in total, I reckon. Yeah. Let me, let me ask, how many times did you have to edit that first scene that you wrote? Was it was it pretty edited? Uh, well, I mean, did you need a lot of work on it, or was it pretty good? Yeah, that first book I edited a lot. I did a lot of self editing. I kept on going back through my day job. I was a technical writer, and so uh -huh. we did. Um, so I did editing as my day job as well, and so. I gave it to lots of different people to read and got comments and I changed it. And I, you know, I kept on tweaking and changing it. And eventually in the end, there's actually, um, 
the, the last thing I wrote on that book was the prologue that I stuck at the beginning. So I suddenly had, I changed the ending of the book right at the end when I was, I'd finished, basically I'd finished writing it. And um, I decided that I had to change the end to make it a better ending. And so, and then I, then it, this sparked bits of imagination. I thought, oh, you know what? To tie in with the ending, I could have a prologue that kind of sets up the foreshadowing of what's going to happen. And suddenly the last thing I wrote became the very first thing in the book. So that wow. scene that I wrote back in 2001 is still there, edited, but it's still there. But it's the yeah. first chapter, but there's a prologue before it that I wrote afterwards. So I'll tie up the end, basically. Sorry? To, to help tie up the end, yeah, to, yeah, to, yeah. And to sort of set the scene and, and to be more. To, I realised that the first the first chapter I'd written wasn't um, it, it had no action, so it was just a guy arriving on a beach and going up, a, you know, talking to some people, and, you know, and it's the kind of thing that when you're writing it, you're thinking, wow, this is interesting because you're learning. You're thinking, wow, this fortress. What does the fortress look like? That, but then you think with a reader, they don't want to read. They want the first page. They want something to happen right at the first page. Yeah. We'll so the explode. first page now starts off the very first line is um is let's see if i can just i can just tell you the first line is the man stood in the shadows preparing for murder yeah so that's the first line now which is a bit more Dude, gripping than that's he so walked awesome down the ship and walked up a, a hill you know <laughs> that's so fantastic i did the exact same thing for my book um i went i finished the entire book and then i went back and read the beginning and i was like ah this is like I want to, you know, I've read, I've read all these books about like the psychology of gripping people and like trying to, you know, hook people in. And so I wrote like a two page, just like the universe is going to explode kind of, kind of a beginning. That's, I mean, you have to do it though. And I think it, it added, it adds to it, right? The first couple of pages, if you don't grip people, then they're not going to want to read the rest of the book. So yeah, that's why we were flailing swords and stuff like that at the beginning of this interview. <laughs> is that why? I don't know. Man, <laughs> it might have been fine. I always hey, keep mine to the hand just in case. I'm always interested about castles in England because uh, Eddie Izzard, he's one of my favorite comedians. All right. Yeah. I actually, I'm actually getting to go to see him in April here in Atlanta. Okay. Um, Say hello from me. He, you know, do you, uh, have you seen him live or? No. You, you know, you know <laughs> I don't what I'm talking know about, right? You don't know? I know him? of him. I know of him. Yeah, okay. I know of him. Yeah. He's, he's hilarious, man. But he talked about in one of his bits about how everybody like there's castles so many castles in england they're basically just handing them out to people i mean they're like just giving away keys like you want a castle you want a castle he's got a great bit about um cake cake or death during the whole period of when they were like you know killing people or during christianity and like beheading people but anyway the whole reason i was <laughs> the whole, i don't know it's really funny but the whole reason i was asking is because are there really like a, i've never been out that way are there really like just castles on every block not on every block, but there are quite a lot of castles. But the castles that he's probably talking about are, are later than the period that I write about. So um, most of the castles in Britain are actually from the after the Norman conquest. So you know, um, do you know, 1066, the Battle of Hastings. Yeah. Uh, the Normans invaded. Um, so it's all. So the Normans are really basically Vikings that had settled in Normandy um, and end up being French and then so they they then um, came and conquered um, uh, England and, and and from that point on they actually started building all these um, stone castles to oh. cement their power in the in, in what was an Anglo-Saxon country so they th there's a lot of castles all over the place and they're all in these areas where there was conflict or there were borders with the Welsh and different places to protect different different regions. It's like they were playing it's like they were playing Monopoly, basically, and like they're like, let's basically, build a hotel basically. here, a hotel here. Well, basically, like, but I, that, I guess it's, great. I guess it's, I guess it's more like um, when yeah, when the US or or the UK go and fly into Afghanistan or something, and they make yeah. these these camps. Now they make like temporary camps that then get sort of struck and disappear. But I mean, in those days they they built stone camps, and that was it. And then they had their base, and they would go out and sort of conquer the area around and. I can't imagine how long that would take to build a camp like that. <laughs> like, yeah, all those yeah. stones, and like they must have had aliens. I think, I th well, I think they started. So, if you in that period, I think they actually started in wood. So they'd build them in wood, and then they then they reinforced them over time. So over the next you know ten years, they'd, they'd have they build quite quickly a wooden fortress, and then right. within the walls of the wooden fortress, they start building the stone keep, and then they'd build you know the next outbuildings, and then then they'd build the walls again in stone. So they sort of slowly build it and make it permanent so if 
would a wooden castle is a wooden castle a real thing? Yeah. Like what can yes, what, what makes a castle? Is it like well, uh, stick a stick a moat around it and a wall around it and some guards <laughs> on top? You got a moat. <laughs> you got a moat, <laughs> and you got a drawbridge, <laughs> and you yeah, got a castle. And some towers with with guys in with arrows and crossbows and stuff shooting you. I guess that's a well, castle. I know, right? I know what I'm doing later today. I'm digging a moat around. <laughs> you build a moat around your house. It's a castle. Absolutely. King of the castle. So you can wave that dagger around and wait until somebody comes <laughs> and arrests you. <laughs> Bring me grapes and wine. Oh. <laughs> that's fantastic, man. So cool. Um, so all your books are are published. They're all out there. Are you working on any anything now? Yeah, all the books are out there. In um, most of them are out in hardback and in um, softback, so paperback. And um, I've got the sixth one coming out. So the sixth one comes out in May. So that's not published okay. yet. Um, they're all available in audiobook form as well. Um, and I mentioned a novella. There's a novella as well called Kin of Cain, which is like a prequel, sort of standalone prequel from the for the series. That one isn't out on audiobook, but um, okay. anyway. And hey, I'm, so how I'm, do you how do you go about getting your audiobook stuff set up? Is that was it? Did your publishing company do that all for that you? Was through, that was through the publisher as well. So I think the publisher sold the rights. So I sold the rights to the basically I gave the rights to the publisher to sell, and they sold yeah. the audio rights to Audible. Um, so Audible, um, which of course is part of Amazon, they they went and, and bought the rights and then got a, an actor to 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 do the. the recording and everything and it was great it was actually really good really interesting experience so a guy called barnaby edwards who's a british actor and he's yeah. like you know proper proper actor and he's um he's do you, do you watch do you, yeah an actor do you know um do you watch doctor who i've seen some episodes i'm not a, i haven't watched so a lot of it i know it's like the greatest watching. show ever right there'll be some people watching this who will be fans of doctor who i'm sure yeah probably um and yeah barnaby edwards is um is a dalek so for those fans they'll know so the daleks are like robot android oh, robot okay. things that are going around killing everybody and they're the baddies <laughs> he was one of, he was the voice of the daleks i think because so, anyway so yeah, people will know. <laughs> and um, anyway so he, he must he have a really the, cool voice huh He's he's got a very good voice and he does he does all the accents he, and the whole process was really interesting because he contacted me and said you know can you tell me give me the list of all the characters and tell me where they come from and and what sort of accent you'd like and you know, I'm thinking of this accent and how do you pronounce their names and it was a lot of communication about getting it right um, wow. beforehand which was which was really good I was really pleased with um, because I I've, I've heard of sort of horror stories where people are not involved in the process at all because he didn't need to involve me in the process. So I was very pleased that he did. Um, I don't know if you can hear my dog barking now, but um, I don't know if you can hear that. Okay. But um, <laughs> so, he was, uh, but he was really great. So he involved me in the process and he did a great job. Um, and yeah, I've heard. So I was going to say I've heard horror stories before of, um, of of people listening to the audiobook of their of their books when they've been done and and just think, oh my god, you know, you pronounce the names wrong or you've got you know the, the accents are wrong or whatever, you know, and, and so well, I'm, you, I'm a big fan of audiobooks for sure, and I've listened to some, and I'm just like, oh, I feel bad for the the author because it's just like, what, man? Like, and I'm sure the actor is a fantastic actor, and they do, you know, but it's just yeah. like the pairing sometimes it doesn't the, quite click, right? Sometimes yeah, it just the pairing, don't quite the genre get. and the voice or whatever it is just doesn't click. So that's that's good that you uh you found a good one. I've actually been doing my own recordings of my books. <laughs> All right, <laughs> like, okay. I do readings on my channel too of of my book. I, I wrote a book called Dead Heart, and it's it's a uh, it's about um, a knight, the son of Sir Lancelot. Basically, he becomes okay. a zombie. He gets killed and becomes a zombie. So, I but I do the happens. Yeah, it's the worst, man. <laughs> it's like, come on, not again. <laughs> no, but I think it's it's fun though, right? Because it's uh you get to actually act out the book. And when yeah. you get to hear it, I'm sure it's a pretty profound thing to hear. Like, oh wow, it makes you feel like you made it. You yeah, know? I've considered I've considered um, recording them as well myself. I've thought about it like future books. I'd quite like to do that, but I haven't done it yet. So you, you asked if I'm writing anything new. So I've just finished yeah. another novel, which is either the first in a new series or it's a standalone, okay. depending on on what gets decided, I guess. Um, but it stands alone. You know, the story beginning, and middle, and end. Um, but it's a new character, a new time, and it actually is a couple of hundred years later, set in a different p place, set closer to where I live, actually in Wessex. And it's um, so it's the early Viking age, so it's the beginning of the Vikings coming okay. into um, 
into Britain. And, and that tentatively is called Dark Frontier, that book. And um, I, I was talking to the publisher yesterday about it because they haven't seen it yet. Nobody's seen it. My agent hasn't seen it. And I said, it's kind of, I said, you have to imagine, um, well, what, how did I pitch it to him? I said, um, well, there's, a, there's a, a famous survivalist in the UK called Ray Mears, which you've probably never heard of. But imagine like Bear Grylls, I guess. You've heard of Bear, oh, yeah. Bear Grylls? Yeah. You heard of yeah. So friends, we hang out in the woods all the time together. Yeah. Well, I, I've, heard, <laughs> I've heard that. I've heard that. So I just I described it as um, true grit, you know, the Western true grit. Yeah. So true mm -hmm. grit meets Bear Grylls meets Rambo oh, in the yeah. Dark Ages. So it's kind of yeah, running intense. through the forest. And so nobody's heard about this, or nobody's seen it. No, nobody's read it. One person's read it, apart from me. Will you read the first paragraph of it for us? I don't. I don't know if I've even. Uh, well, maybe. Like, where is he? Let's see if I can. I don't know if I can. If I close. If I minimize this, does it cut you off? Let me have a look. Let me see if I can. If I can pull it up on the screen, I'll read you a couple of lines. Let's see. That would be I've actually amazing. got it open because, of course, I'm, I was working on the blurb for it today. So, Isn't let me that see. The best part working on those blurbs, man. I can't ever figure out how to All. summarize anything. Okay, so, <laughs> I can, so can you still see me? Yeah, yeah, yeah you're good. Yeah, right. So I can, I can just about see the, the screen. Um, let me just see if I can do this. Right. Let's see then. Okay, this is an exclusive for you. Exclusive of yeah. Matthew Harfie's soon-to-be novel, Dark Frontier. Dark Frontier. Okay, so this is it. This is before anyone's seen it. Oh, man. Okay, you ready? Yeah, we're ready. It had been a good morning until Dunstan found the corpse. When he left the hut, there had been nothing to suggest the grisly secret that was hiding in the clearing deep within the forest. The weather was fine. A misty haze lingered in the folds of the land and along the winding course of the river Frama. There was a crisp bite to the air, but Dunstan knew from the experience of many years that the mist would burn off as the sun climbed into the summer sky. Sparrows scattered, bursting forth from the bracken as Odin, Dunstan's rangy merle hound, sped off into the undergrowth. To see the dog run always lifted Dunstan's spirits. The dog was close to seven years old, but seemed to think it was still a pup. Such was its vigour and energy. There you go. Wow. There you go. Dude, that was awesome, man. You heard it here first. <laughs> the first line, too. Corpse. There's a corpse in there. Corpse is the first line. You've, you've got to have like a corpse. Guy's in some, yeah, it sounds like this guy's in some uh, spooky-ass place. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it gets worse. <laughs> yeah, I, can, I, I mean, you don't just go hanging out in those kind of places. <laughs> Yeah, if you don't, yeah, you know, I'd say, I, I, yeah, if my books aren't for the faint-hearted. <laughs> so there's a lot. Is it uh, like gory or? There's quite a lot of fighting, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's based in sort of, you know, real life. So it's not fantasy. There's no monsters and aliens and zombies right. and things like that. But um, people stand next to, you know, in front of each other with shields and swords and hack each other to death. You know, so. Yeah. <laughs> So you must you you uh, really enjoy writing. <laughs> Thank God this is a Skype call. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you enjoy writing fighting scenes, then, huh? Yes, I do actually. Yeah, I do. I think it's one of the the, the, the bits that's most fun. Although it becomes this, difficult to find original. I'm one too. I'm one that kind of struggles because it feels like I have to include so much in the scene. And I, it almost becomes overwhelming. Like, how do I write all this stuff? What do you have? Like a method you go about to writing a fight scene? Not really. I just try to. I, I try to obviously try to visualize what's going on in in you know in my head. So in terms of positions of who's where and who you know the, the physical nature of the scene is important. You know who's who's running yeah. where and you know all that stuff. Um, but I think the most important thing for me is the fact that if you make sure that you're telling it, it's not. So the physical stuff is important, but you're not just telling the physical action. So there's a lot of, you know, sword swinging and blood splattering and, you know, that stuff. But you've got to get inside one character's mind so that yeah. every few 
paragraphs or every few lines, there's something that makes you care about them. Right? So they're a character that you care about anyway because they're in this fight and you're, you're reading about them. But there's more than them just swinging and hacking and killing. They're actually worried or they're frightened or they're hurt or they're you know they're, they're, they're scared they're going to die or they're worried they're not going to reach their friends in time it's all of that emotional investment in the character that makes it more exciting i think for the reader so you're focusing on the one character inside the mind getting into their you, emotional yeah, state yeah yeah as so they, they're hacking people to bits or trying to keep from dying and... exactly yeah yeah and i think that's what that's what sort of makes people you know, get into the scene, right? It's a visceral thing because then suddenly you can put yourself in that person's place and think, shit, you know, this is scary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, because otherwise it's like, for me, trying to write write fighting scenes, it's, it's it was it was something that was so difficult because I just wanted to throw, like, there's a million people fighting each other in this scene and yeah. how do I tell you that besides, like, you know, there's a million people. Him highlighting yeah. a million, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, it becomes a difficult thing unless you're like inside the person's head, and, and they're just becoming overwhelmed by the immense amount of bodies flying at them, or you know, whatever it is, yeah. right? And That's sometimes weird. it does it, it does get tiring. I think one of the things yeah. I've done in big battle scenes, I've got a couple in in some of the books where there's big battles between you know two armies. Maybe in my books, a big battle, maybe like five hundred people on each side or something. But it's that's a you know it's a lot of people to be fighting with swords, and yeah. and it gets you, know, you write in a lot of action. And what I do sometimes is I take a break from it and take you know end a chapter on a bit of a cliffhanger. You know, maybe you don't know what's going to happen. You know whether the guy survived or not. And then take it somewhere completely different, and then do the you know have a have a a, a chapter of the women back home or or something. So, so you do all your breath. third person narration kind of. Um, yeah. So you'd yeah. have multiple points of view, but each chapter maybe focused on one uh, one character. And so yeah, I take it out of the action and maybe have something else going on to give everyone a bit of a rest, including yeah. me as the writer. But the, re the you know the readers I think need a bit of a breather, and then you can yeah. throw it back into the action again and sort of you know pick up from there. That's so important. I had I did that with uh, my first book too. Is like the third person because I was getting wore out, like from nonstop. Like this is happening. I was like, can they, they can they have a break? Like I felt bad for the characters. I was like, give them the, cut them some slack, man. <laughs> you know. So I had to change the narration. Could never cut break. never cut them any slack. <laughs> just keep. So after out. after six books, the main character is just so smashed up. It's like right. <laughs> it's like amazed that he's still alive somehow. Yeah, exactly. That's awesome, man. Um, Matthew, I feel like I could talk to you about this stuff all day, man. This has been a fantastic uh, interview. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thanks um, for having me. And my pleasure, man. I do want to ask you, because I ask everybody this, and I think it's a very crucial uh, part to our writing. Um, I, want, I want to know what your legacy is that you're looking to leave. Um, you know, we talked about voice, but what do you what do you want the world to know about Matthew Harfey? That's a, that's a big one. I was talking recently to somebody about... <laughs> about about my my about legacy and leaving a legacy yeah uh, now i guess i guess just some good stories right yeah. <laughs> apart from the obvious apart from leaving you know a happy family i've got kids and all of that is my legacy as well obviously uh, um, but i think when it comes to the writing i just like people to to enjoy the books and, and enjoy a good story and if i can you know if i can make a living out of telling stories then that's kind of like the dream come true and if 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 when i've gone people are still reading the books then how amazing would that be that, I mean, that's it, man, right? You become immortal at that point. In some strange way. To yeah. Some, yeah, some weird way people still think of it. <laughs> Just... Well, yeah, I hear you. <laughs> well, very cool, man. Um, thank you so much again. I'm going to link all your work uh, in the description of this video. Um, Thanks very much. And we can all find you on Twitter at Matthew Harfey. All right. Yep. If, if anybody else wants to get in contact with you, I mean, do you have uh, like a Facebook page for your for your work and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. So if you search for Matthew Harfey author on Facebook, I've got a Facebook page and Harfey is H-A-R-F-F-Y. Um, and I've also got MatthewHarfey.com. Um, and there's links to everything from there. And you mentioned Twitter already. And there's a I've got a blog that's linked from there as well. So, okay. yeah. If you search for my, for my MatthewHarfey.com, it's probably the easiest way to find everything. Does that will that uh, direct everybody to all your other stuff, MatthewHarfey.com? Yeah, there's links there to the Facebook and Twitter and, and everything. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a favorite quote you'd like to? 
Hmm. Not off the top of my head. <laughs> you could have told me to prepare what? a quote. No way, man. Would you would you like to make one up? I had a um, in my interview with uh, Stephanie and her daughter Ellie, Ellie Collins um, the other day. It, the one went up today or yesterday. Her daughter had this quote. It was um, hot. What, what was it? Um, not everybody can be a pork chop because hot. Some of us need, need hot dogs too, or something like that. I don't know. It was really good. <laughs> it was good, but you can't remember it. Okay, I, I thought of something. It was here, here you go. It's about pork chops and hot dogs. Here you go. Here you go. <laughs> When writing historical fiction, here is my this is my motto when writing historical fiction. So I'll leave this as my quote, okay? Okay. Let's hear it. When writing historical fiction, think story over history and think authenticity over accuracy. Which I'm saying basically the story is more important than the history and it's more important to feel real than it is to be exactly perfectly accurate according to the historical events. I think the story is paramount. Very wise. That's Very it. Wise. Thank you, Matthew, so much. We really Thanks, appreciate Matt. it. Um, you have a wonderful day. Thank you for joining the Unowebs interview show where all people become one people. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. We'll see you on the other side. I'll see you soon. Yo, let me ask you a question. You like this video? Huh? Huh? You like it? Was it good? Was it good? If you did like it, uh, please subscribe. Thanks.